Howard Pyle was an American illustrator, painter, and author who lived from 1853 to 1911. He wrote and illustrated a number of books, in addition to numerous illustrations done for Harper's Weekly, other periodicals, and various works of fiction for children and young adults. His 1883 classic, The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood, remains in print. In 1896, he published a story with his own illustrations called Through Inland Waters in Harper's Monthly Magazine. Depicted with pen and pencil in the May and June issues, Pyle shared his adventures aboard a canal boat, traveling from New York City along the Hudson River to Waterford, and then through the Champlain Canal north to Whitehall and Lake Champlain. These are excerpts from his trip. Maybe it is only a very tired worker, in an interval of well-earned rest, who can so relax the keenly drawn purposes of his life as to enter fully into the pleasures of the slow cruising of a canal boat through the peaceful stretches of inland waterways upon whose placid bosom its voyage lies. For one must have a hearty yearning for complete inertia to really find enjoyment in slowly floating two or three miles an hour, even though such leisurely drifting lies through beautiful pastoral levels of farmlands, by the side of shady orchards and bright meadows, in the lap of hills, or maybe at the feet of looming mountains. One must be in proper spirit to enter into the remote life of the simple, kindly people whom one meets in this peaceful inland voyaging. I do not think there is any class exactly parallel with them. They, the canal voyagers, are neither of the water nor of the land, but their characteristics partake of both. They are within touch of the woods and fields, yet they are in no wise identified with the pastoral surroundings through which they drift in their slow and placid peregrinations. There are not forty feet of water separating the boat from the dry land. The captain, maybe, steps ashore at the lock to snub the boat or to buy something at the store, but he is as remote from the interests of fields and meadows, of hamlet or village, as though miles of salt water separated the clumsy craft from the banks of the towpath and the heel path alongside. And yet, his life is not the life of the true water-going man. The boat is not a ship. It is a floating home, and the captain carries with him his wife and his children upon the voyage. The cat, the dog, the canary bird, and the potted plants. The children play about the level of the unrailed deck. The dog barks from the roof of the cabin. The cat basks in the sun at the top of the companionway. The housewife, busied in the 20-foot cabin house below deck, appears for a moment at the door of the scuttle to exchange word with the head of the floating home as he stands backed against the tiller, the warm air from off the fields, blowing the wisps of tobacco smoke from his pipe away into the sunlit space. The floating water home is altogether a part of the inland picture into which it is fitted, and in the mellow evening when the children are in bed, the captain and his wife may sit together upon the cabin roof, looking out across a peaceful landscape of woods and meadowlands, in which, albeit, they have no part. The life circumjacent to these inland waters clusters away more thickly about the canal locks, where the heavy boats are raised or lowered to a different level of water. Here, one always finds the lock house, the lock keeper's dwelling, and generally a store where the boatmen may purchase such staple commodities as tea, coffee, provisions, and tobacco. Oftentimes, a little group of houses cluster into a small village, but always there is the lock house, and nearby, always a store. Nearly always, there would be a cluster of men gathered around in front of the store, over beyond the lock on such an evening, some back tilted in chairs, all withdrawn into that peculiar silence that is so characteristic of folk of narrow surroundings. A silence that makes one think that they must have exhausted what subjects they one time had to talk about, and are cast back introspectively into the recesses of their own souls. Sometimes the mountaineers come down from the hills for fresh supplies of tobacco or molasses, and will add their quota to this inert group, for even the coming of such outsiders did not seem to arouse any marked degree of interest. One old mountaineer who thus came down from the mountain was a very picturesque figure. He had a shaggy red beard and a crop of reddish hair, and a pair of twinkling gray eyes that looked at you very sharply from out their shaggy overhang of brows. I made this picture of him. He had a good story of a bear he had unexpectedly met up in the mountains one day, but the regular habitants of the place laughed so much about it that I could not get him to tell it to me. He would tell me very willingly about the poppy wood he cut up in the mountains, how much he got for it, how he lived through the long cold winter, how many children he had, but he did not seem even to hear me when I asked him about the bear. I would have liked to have heard that story. Maybe some future voyager through those parts may be more successful than I in digging it out from its rugged earth. You find everywhere reminiscences of the past clinging like a green growth about these northern inland waterways. I spent nearly an hour one still and tranquil evening with an old lock keeper, listening to his narratives of those bygone days. He told me with great circumlocution of how the rival packet companies used to run their boats with twelve horse teams and a great show of colored trappings and jangling bells, of how the crews of the packets used to quarrel whenever they would meet, of how the companies always provided crews of fighting men to punch the heads of the crews of the opposition line. He told me of how the passengers used to crowd the decks, of how the gentlemen used to step ashore at the locks, of how the bar could not supply them fast enough with drink. 
The presence of the smooth, glassy stretch of waterway and the cataractal rush of water overflowing the upper gate into the lock were the continual accompaniments to his words, the background of the narrative, and they made it all seem very real. I could picture to myself those old-time packets, their decks crowded with passengers. The men with bell-crowned hats, high-rolling collars and stocks. The women with smoothly brushed hair, big bonnets, ample skirts, and a log of mutton sleeves. I could fancy the Homeric battles of the fighting crews, their red shirts, the hair curled forward over the cheeks, the trousers tucked into their top boots. I can imagine the shouting and brawling when the packets met, the screaming of the ladies and the confusion of the gentlemen. The old lock keeper got up to open the gates to some oncoming boat, and I sat and watched the lumbering hulk as it sank lower and lower into the lock with a vast and tremendous rushing of water out of the wickets. I did not go away, and by and by, the old man came back and resumed his reminiscences, and I sat there, far into the gathering of the warm starry darkness, beholding through him, as it were, a glimpse of other days, and of another life, gone never to return, excepting in the dim twilight of the imagination.